My name is Setu Raman Panchanathan, and people call me Panch. And one of the reasons why this happened, I think, is also because um, my area of research for my PhD was video compression. So I thought at least I should compress my name. So I thought I'll just sort of walk through some of the things that I have felt that essentially has helped me in my journey as I'm doing my work or whatever I'm doing in my life. Um, what I'm trying to do is I'm just, I just was sitting yesterday in Calcutta Airport. I had to wait for five hours. So I just jotted down a few points. I thought that I would probably try to emphasize uh, here in this talk. You know, one of the things that I've noticed that has helped me a lot is pursuing excellence for excellence sake, not for any other objective, but just pure excellence. Now, this is something that I learned from my dad many, many years ago, is I watched him and, uh, you know, he just wouldn't worry about any other thing. I mean, it's just you could see that he was just enjoying the science for the sake of science, not for anything else, not for you know, solving a problem or not for necessarily gaining any prominence, not for anything, but just simply purely enjoying science as he delved into the science. And I thought that was amazing to me to watch my father be that way. In a sense, he's my role model, uh, I have to say. He's a, he's, he was a professor, so I'm a professor too. But I, some of the things that I really enjoy is the fact that he enjoyed excellence for excellence itself with no specific objective. And I think, you know, when I talk about making an impact, because we're all here in this world and we spend certain number of years, whatever the number of years that has been granted to us. But at the end of the day, when we leave, I think what I would like to do is two things. One is that I would like to be a better human being than I came in. So whatever the delta X might be, if I came in with X, I'm leaving with delta X. And if I believe in the theory of reincarnation, I'm not trying to make once again judgments of one religion or another or whatever it is. I'm just purely saying that, you know, I should have been a better person by, by the time I leave, then I came in there. Okay, so that's, that's one thing as a guiding principle that I want to have. The, the second guiding principle that I want to have is, I want to have an impact on the environment around me. That by that I mean people, whatever that might be. Hopefully, those are two things that I want to lead as you know, things that I want to you know, accomplish in this lifetime. And now, if you bring in the concept of excellence and service together, that brings a tremendous amount of force into what you can really do in your life. If I take my life and if I organize it into some compartments, I would say the compartments would be the work compartment. That is the time that I spend doing work. is one compartment of my life. So what is the other compartment of my life? The other compartment of my life is I love to have fun. So I just do a lot of activities. Play cricket maybe, do this, play, watch a movie or watch a television show. Whatever that might be, I love to do and I have a lot of fun. So I just love that part of my life. The third thing that I do, hopefully, is, as I said, service being defined very broadly. You know, for me, service is just taking my son to the tennis game. That's my service. So that's good enough. So basically, when you look at this compartment, you know, whatever work I do uh, or, or, or stuff that I do that I think of as service, so that's another thing that I do. So these are three compartments, and I'm sure all of you have the, these compartments in your lives. Now that I've defined them to be extremely broad and not with the typical connotations that go with these kinds of things. So now that we have these three compartments, what I would like each of you to do, and I'm glad that you have these sheets of paper here, so you're very thoughtful. So basically what you're going to do is if you have a pen, I want you to write out you know, a couple of things that fits within these um, categories in your own life. So what do you think of as work? What do you think of as fun that you do in your daily life? And what do you think of as service that you do in your daily life? Now tell me, what are the work that you do you think is also service? I mean, did you, in other words, you wrote some things in work which also can fall under service. And what are the things that you thought were work that's also fun? What are the things that you do as service is also fun? And if any, something right here. So maybe so that you can tell me uh, what you wrote as work. Higher fire motivate train. Okay, that's good. Higher fire motivate train. That's fantastic. Does anyone does any of those fall under any of the other categories so that in your view? Yes. Yes, which one of them? Train and motivation goes into all three. Our train motivation goes into all three, so it's right here in your view. Okay, great, fantastic. So that's the answer. In this situation, what I'm trying to do here is I'm provoking some thought, hopefully, and you will go away with these questions. Why is that my work, all my work is not service? Why is all my service not fun? Why is all the work that I do not fun? Why is it that all that I do in my life, day in and day out from morning to night, is not just a fusion of all of the three? Why is it not that? Okay? And I just want to leave those thoughts with you. And you'll sort it out among yourselves in whatever way you want. Just simply ask the question. That alone, I think, provoking the thought in your heads will achieve a lot within yourself. And I agree with Sikha. At the end of the day, it's a lot. And that's why I, I, provo I sort of engaged with him and asked him, what do you think it's all about you? What, what's it really about? Right? So I think at the end of the day, it's all about us.
Okay, it's all internal at the end of the day. And therefore, asking these questions is internalizing the process. When you're a professor, you have three jobs. You have three jobs as a definer, as part of being a professor. Job number one, that you will teach your students. Undergraduate, graduate, mentoring PhD students, etc., etc., etc. So that's one job for him as part of my job description. The second job that I have as part of my job description is that I will do research. Research is just basically creative thinking. Then you have the third component of my job is the term it interestingly as service. Service means, you know, I, act, I, I, I participate in committees to make an effect a change in the curriculum or research process, whatever that might be. That's called internal institutional service. And there's a component of service which is external. And the external service is about basically helping, you know, the IEEE, for example. So it's called professional service. So you do a lot of professional service. You evaluate other people's PhD theses. You evaluate people who go for promotion, tenure, etc. So basically, that's part of your persona. So your persona has three parts to it. The teaching part, the research part, and service part. Why am I not able to bring all of them together? Why can't my research be in itself something that has a service component? Okay? And here I the term service as not just service to my profession or service to my fellow faculty members or students. I broaden that term and say service to humanity at large. So we toss around these ideas right, left, and center. Nothing seemed to actually make me feel this is what I wanted to do. It just was still sort of in the air kind of a thing. And as we were discussing this, as we were discussing this, out popped a question from one of my colleagues. He asked me, Punch, how about working with individuals who are blind? In fact, he didn't say individuals who are blind, he said blind people. That's what he said. How about working for the blind people? And this seems almost antithetical to me. It's almost like, wow, now I'm going to have to do some image processing for people who cannot see images? That's seems like totally counterintuitive to what this is all about. But yet, it seemed right. So I told him, I think you're right, Satchu. We should definitely pursue that. Let's not talk about it. So I just go to this meeting, and this lady, she was there in this meeting, and she was just absolutely animated. And at the end of the meeting, I go to her, and I say, I really need to talk to this lady and find out what it means to work for, a, you know, for the blind. So she may be able to articulate and tell me what exactly it means to work for the blind. One thing she advised me, she said, Punch, if you really want to work for individuals who are blind, and she said, remember how I phrased it? Individuals who are blind, not blind individuals, not blind people, not blind. We all call people blind, he is blind. It is not the blindness that defines them. A blind person, okay, or a person who is blind, is not a dumb person. He's not a person without cognitive abilities. He's not a person without a brain. What we do is just because they don't have sight, we think therefore they are not capable of doing any processing. So Terry told me, if you really want to help me, what you need to do is when I come into the room, you say, hey Terry, just walk, take two steps forward. The chair left to you is free. That's all I need to know. I know how to take two steps. I know which chair is that that is free. I can go and sit myself. You don't have to take me and drag me and put me there as if because I'm blind, I cannot therefore process any information. I have cognitive abilities. I have the brains to process things. So compensate for the thing that I don't have. Don't comp overcompensate by giving me everything that I don't want. Wouldn't it be nice if a device can prompt them and tell them, we would love to have a device that can help us in social interactions. So now I have got an interesting problem. Now I've got a camera on glasses, which is almost unnoticeable. As soon as you enter the room, it will say, Sandil is in front of you. We are working on algorithms and processes which can then say, Sandil looks happy, he looks tense, right? And that, that information is not just communicated to audio because that audio channel is always full with information right now. But um, the bottom line is you also want to use other channels. So for example, we have designed a vibrotactile belt, a vibrotactile belt that vibrates based on where the person is relative to you. So you want to stretch. When I see Sandal, I approach him, I stretch my hand, and I shake his hand. But if I do not know where Sandal is in relationship to me, relationship to me, I would not know how to approach him. So this vibrotactile device potentially tells where Sandal is. So for example, if Sandal is right in front of me, this vibrotactile belt, this device will go on. On the other hand, if Sandal is here, this will go on, and I turn, and this will go on. It will tell me that he's in front of you, and you can also code it by haptics work. It can tell you how far they are in front of you. If I can reach the appropriate distance, stretch out my hand and say, "How oh, Sandal, how are you?" I can initiate the conversation, not wait for the other person to initiate the conversations. So some of the lessons learned in a very humble way. Instead of technology for technology's sake, it's got to be technology with a purpose. 
And usually I find that when you have a purpose for a technology, then the technology, the type of technology that you design is at a whole different level than the level of technology enhancement that you do normally. I oftentimes catch myself doing things that not what my mother or father told me or a teacher told me. I catch myself doing the things that I saw my father do or my mother do or my teacher do. And so it started to actually make an impact in me. In the sense that rather than doing this which I'm doing right now, I actually can communicate a lot more to my children, to my fellow employees, to everybody around me, to the entire environment around me. Instead of doing this, if I am who I say that I would like all of you to be or want to do, if I am, then none of this is even necessary. So first be, as a leader, the most important thing I find, I have found in my experience, is if you are an example, if you, are, if you lead by example, that's good enough. You don't have to say anything to anybody. So be a leader and lead by example. And then do, just don't be, but also do. So whatever you want to be, do so that people can actually see what you do. Not because people see it. You want people to see it, but people will notice it because you do it. That's who you are. And then if you tell, it has some value. Some things that have helped me, excellence and pride in my work. I love my work. I get up in the morning, I'm so anxious to get to work. Be curious always. Be eager to learn. Don't shun away opportunities to learn. And be absolutely confident. Oftentimes the problem with all of us is, oh, I don't know whether I will do this. I don't know whether I, if I get the promotion, will I really do well in that area? I just don't know. I think I'm not there yet. All of this is unnecessary hangouts. You have been given a task. I always say, what comes to you is meant for you. I found, find that positive attitude always helps. I don't drink alcohol at all. Never have done in my life. So in the US, it's kind of strange for people. So my, my president of my university says, you know, whenever I go to any party, he will say, oh, this guy will not drink alcohol. We should make sure that he has something to drink. And um, so, whatever. so he'll make arrangements. So I don't worry about it. He has to worry about it. Right? He's my boss. Right? He should worry about what I drink. Right? Why should I worry about it? So he then, and then he tells the people ask, you never drank in your I said, no. Is it a religion? I said, no, it's a habit. Um, so basically, at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, when I, when I say these kinds of things, then, then I also warn them. I say, you see how I am? You look like you're always on alcohol. I said, yes. <laughs> that is why I should not drink alcohol. <laughs> because alcohol loosens you up and you're getting a little bit in a hyper. He says, you're always hyper punch. So I don't know how you will answer that. Then the next thing, I don't know how you will be if you actually drank alcohol. I said, you don't want to know. <laughs> I always tell people, smile. What is smile? I mean, how, what are you going to lose by smiling at them? There is no law in carrying a smile. It's so free. You no know, free. It's inexpensive and it is contagious. I have never seen when I have smiled, somebody say, mm. so this is not, I mean, once again, it's not a spiritual talk or religious talk. I'm just talking from my own experience. I'm telling you some things. I don't practice all of this, so don't hold me to it. So tomorrow, if I'm morose one day and I don't smile at you, don't tell me, you told me that day, you'll always smile. I could have a bad day too. <laughs> but oftentimes, I find the problem that I have is when I go back and see why I have not done well or why I have messed up a situation, it's because I've taken things too seriously. So being in the world and yet being not of the world, I think is a very important quality that we need to acquire. But you know, being really happy is what this is all about. It's a fun place. It's, you know, you enjoy it. And I think uh, the best thing that you can ask for is two bosses that you have, who I know very, very well, uh, Jayendra and Sendhil. And these guys are as good as it gets. This is a great environment. They've got the value system right here. A combination of work, fun, and service which comes together as an organization to have that kind of a design imperative is huge. Very few, very few have that kind of design imperative. An organizational spirit has to be permeated and infused everywhere. That's one of the good things that, you know, that, that the leader can do is to infuse that enthusiasm and permeation across, those, across the organization. That's extremely important. We've been finding ideas for life as a series of talks by people oh, who've been working in different fields. Great. And your talk today is the first of the series. Thank you for being the first person oh, to do that.